So can I ask your permission to go ahead and open up the word today? I'm glad three of you gave me that permission. I'm going to ask permission to open up the word of God today. Is that all right? Amen. Let's turn to Luke chapter 10 in our Bibles, on our cell phones, on our pads. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. As you know, we've been in a series called Who is My Neighbor? And uh, we're just going to continue with that today. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. Verse 29, but he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In fact, I'm not going to add to the word of God, but I'm thinking, using my imagination, I'm, I'm just thinking, this guy said, and just who is my neighbor? Just who is my neighbor? He was wanting to have a shorter list of neighbors instead of a longer list of neighbors. After this, Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan. But that's the question that we've been looking at. Who is my neighbor? Proverbs 31, 8 and 9 says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. Our first Sunday, we talked about children are our neighbors. And Jesus said, whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. The next Sunday, we talked about women and widows in particular. And James 1.27 says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows. Last Sunday, we had a powerful, powerful service. And we talked about people of color are our neighbors. And we looked at Acts 10, verses 34 and 35. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. In Acts 17, verse 26, From one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Little did I know that we were going to end up on this Sunday with Brother Dick Wellens here. And this Sunday, I want to talk about the stranger. The stranger is our neighbor. The stranger is our neighbor. Jesus said in Matthew 25, 35, I was a stranger and you took me in. You welcomed me. You invited me in. That word there is related to the same word that is used for synagogue, which means to gather together. And it means, I was a stranger and you gathered me in. And that verse continues, Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Jesus said, I was a stranger... And you gathered me in. Whatever you did for the least of these brethren of mine, you've done unto me. This word for stranger is xenos. And it means stranger or foreigner or alien. It's the same word that's used in Hebrews 13.2. Do not forget to entertain strangers... By so doing, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Wow. 
Some people have entertained angels without knowing it. How? By entertaining strangers, foreigners, aliens. We know this from the book of Genesis, talking about Abraham when he welcomed the three visitors, and Lot when he welcomed the angels. And by so doing, he ended up saving his own life. So, in Romans chapter 12, verse 13, it says, Extend hospitality to strangers. Now, this is a combination word. It's the word stranger, but it's the word brotherly love. What does that mean? To treat strangers, treat foreigners, treat aliens with brotherly love. Treat them like a brother. I'm not saying that. The Word of God is saying that. Treat them like a brother. Now, this should not surprise us because the Word of God is loaded from front to back with scriptures about being kind to the alien and the stranger. Leviticus 19 Verse 33 and 34, when an alien lives with you in your land, do not mistreat him. The alien living with you must be treated as one of your native born. Love him as yourself, for you were aliens in Egypt. I am Yahweh your God. Love him as yourself. Does that remind you of any other scripture verse? Love your neighbor as yourself. So what's, what's the Scripture saying? This Scripture is saying that the stranger is your neighbor. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love the stranger, the alien, the foreigner as you love yourself. For you were aliens in Egypt. Has anybody here ever been an alien or stranger or foreigner in another country. Okay. I, I had the opportunity to live in China for one school year. You guys have heard me talk about that. And I was treated pretty much across the board royally. I was treated so well. Now, some of them treated me well because they thought I had money. They soon found out that I was just a foreign student and I didn't have that much money. But they still treated me well. They, they found out that I was an American and they treated me well. In communist China, they treated me well. In fact, um, I had a friend that was helping me to uh, interpret as I traveled. I, and I traveled up to Beijing to pick up Denise because she came over. We were engaged at that time, and she came over and, uh, and visited. And so I had a friend that was going with me to translate, and we, we couldn't get any train tickets. And so finally we got the, the lowest train ticket that we could, and that was uh, on an overnight train but it was in the hard seats, they called them, where we would be sitting like this all night long. And so my friend, we got on the train, and my friend said, it was the middle of winter, it was cold, I was all wrapped up. And, and, and my, my friend said, take off your hood. I said, okay, and I took my hood off. And he said, take off your hat because I had a toboggan under my hat under my hood he said take off your hat and then he said let them see your nose now in China they call foreigners like me big noses it 
so you can get the profile effect. And, and uh, so I took off my hat, took off my hood, and he said, now wait till one of the train people comes by. And one of the train people came by and started to talk to him when he saw me. And sure enough, although they said that there weren't any sleeper cars available, they found a place for, for us to go in the, in the further back in the train and found us uh, sleeping arrangements in that overnight train just because I was a big nose. But, but in general, I was treated very well as a foreigner, as an alien in China. Let me ask a quick question. Um, how many people here are 100% Native American? Okay, that was kind of a trick question. Because if you had raised your hand, I was going to ask you which tribe. Yeah, so, so how many of you are, are more than 50% Native American? Okay, more than 50%. Okay, so the reality is that most of us in this room are aliens and strangers in America. Oh, pastor, I can't believe you said that. But the reality is that at one point our ancestors were aliens and strangers here in America. We all came from somewhere else. Boy, it's getting quiet in here. Uh, we, we all came from somewhere else. And so, none of us has a claim, a Native American claim, it seems, to being native-born American, although we we're native now because we've been here so long. Love the alien... Because you were once aliens in Egypt. That's what Leviticus says. Love the alien because you were once aliens in Egypt. In other words, what's he saying? You ought to know how it feels, Israel. You were once aliens in Egypt. And because you were once aliens in Egypt, you should understand what it's like to be aliens and strangers. So treat the aliens and strangers with love. Treat them kindly. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 18 and 19. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the alien. And you are to love those who are aliens. He loves the aliens, so you should love the aliens. I'm not talking about, about outer space creatures. I'm talking about foreigners. We should love them. We should love them. Why? Because God loves them. So, let me ask a few quick questions. How does our nation treat foreigners? Let me ask a more specific question. How does the church treat How does the church treat foreigners? Let me ask a more specific question. How do you personally treat foreigners? 
Every day I'm here, and the child care here is open. We have, we're blessed to have the largest child care in Sevier County. And so, amen. Over 200 kids are here every day. And I'm here when their parents are coming to pick them up. And I'm often hearing Russian and Yugoslavian and Spanish and Portuguese being spoken in the halls. We should love them because God loves them. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. I'm going to ask Maria to come up real quickly. And Maria Malamesi is a precious sister in our congregation. And, and I want her to share just briefly her testimony of how she came to this country. Good morning. All right. All right. Um, I would like to talk a little bit uh, before I came. Um, you can see the fi first picture. Um, that's Bogota, Colombia. I didn't come from the mountains. It was from a city, from the capital of Colombia. And it's huge. has a lot of population. When I came to Manhattan, I thought, it's like Bogota. Hundreds of people uh, walk on the street. Well, the thing is, um, I grew up under a lot of uh, witnessing a lot of um, uh, domestic violence between among my parents. And when I was turned 14 years old, they got separated. And that's a picture of two places where I used to live, um, poor, but my parents sacrificed a lot for me and my brothers to go to a private schools. And over there is Catholic schools. Um, so I graduated. Uh, I did my best when, when my, my parents were struggling and fighting a lot. I felt like I wanted to run away from home uh, to see if they will stop all the fighting, but it didn't work. Um, that was, uh, it, it took about three years, and then um, in those three years, one day, I look at the sky and said, Lord, if you allow me to come to the United States, I, I want to make a difference. And in those three years, my dad said, um, uh, I need a new beginning. Everything brings memories of your mom. I feel like people are following me. And he sent us to, to live to my aunt. So in the bottom picture, um, yes, um, there's a small, humble kitchen where I came to the United States, Glen Cove, New York, Long Island, 1994. And the picture on the side with other people graduating is because as soon as I came to the United States, it was difficult, frustrating to learn a new language. But I, with my brother, we found a Christian church. And I have already gave my heart to the Lord, but I have not repented. So he took me in that church one day. I was 21, 20. I came to the feet of Jesus. I said, Lord, you know my struggles. I have struggles with eating too much sweets. I need you. I had so much stress out of the, out of the normal. I couldn't sleep. Uh, I still <laughs> have problems with insomnia. But at that point, I came. I said, Lord, I don't care who is beside me. I need you. And I went to the front, to the altar, asked for, for prayer. And I think in that moment, I was completely safe. And I finished that insti Bible Institute in Spanish, studying the Bible in Spanish. But I, I wanted to make a difference. So I needed to learn English. So I, I, I saved as much as I could. So I started in a period of 11 years. I took care of different kinds of children beautiful from different country um, families um, in the snow I will walk eight blocks or more uh, to get to the job and one day I said Lord please help me to get a, a car so I save I wouldn't go to McDonald's anything and then my I was living with my aunt my aunt wasn't taking her medicine and she started having really bad problems with bipolar and 
my dad had a dream which he wanted to kill us. So he shared in the church, in, a, in the Latino church, and um, we went to um, live to Flushing, really close is to Queens, where our president is. And over there, you see, is large groups of people like from Asia, uh, Singapore, China. But we continue persevering. Over there, I didn't have an interpreter like I had in Glencove, Long Island. I had friends, Latino. Over there, it was 30 people from Asia, three Latinos. Yeah. So it was completely different. And I felt I couldn't take care of my younger brother. Um, I didn't know how to cook. All this time in high school in Colombia, my parents, my grandma say, go and do your homework. And I didn't learn to cook. So it was really difficult, but I, I did wonderful in my school. And so I started going to, um, I continued my studies. Um, I lived in a, in a room with my brother. We couldn't live with my dad neither. I didn't work out and, um, and there was no kitchen. So I, I had trouble with my health, uh, but I continued persevering six years. I finished my associate's degree in 2002 with a magna cum laude. The first day of class, English 101, I had to take ESL classes too and finish them. There was this teacher who said, called me, decides and said, I don't know what kind of language you're writing, <laughs> and sent me to um, with a mentor in a building. You have to, this university, I mean, college, just community college, was huge. You had to go, you had to run from field to field to make, to get to the, to your class, you know, from one, one class to another. Well, the thing is, I graduated and I praise God for it. And then, and then September 11th, uh, September 11th, 2001 happened. So they doubled the tuition payment to uh, foreigners. So, um, there was no way with my brother, we were sacrificing everything. We couldn't pay college and pay an apartment to live. It was just college and a room. Then some brothers and sisters from our church said, we, we have an extra room, come live with us. And we went like this from families to families. We live with Puerto Ricans, with bol people from Bolivia, um, different, different uh, people until we found uh, some people from Colombia, they say in the basement, you feel more comfortable, we have a studio. When I was living there, I was like, Lord, now what should I do? So then in a Christian concert, like the one we saw before, where, um, yeah, uh, I, I met that person in the red shirt, he's from Dominican Republic, and he's, he had literature about the King's College, and the King's College was located in the Empire State Building in the basement. And, um, and, and I said, but I, I don't think I can make it. And he said, just come, fill up an application. I said the truth. In the college before, there was a guidance counselor that I didn't want her to get into trouble, but I came for help. I said, I don't know how can I continue my studies. I have a good grade point average, uh, but um, I can't. And she said, I'll help you. And we filled out papers, and then along the way, I noticed said that I had to change my identity. And I came home, and I was supposed to submit those papers. And I said, no, Lord, I don't want to lie. I ripped everything. I didn't go back to that person. But God opened that door from that college, and he said, we had private scholarships. So he, I had to do three semesters to do the co program. In one semester, he's, they said, it's about six thousand dollars, but we'll give you three thousand. That that's part of the scholarship, and it's it doesn't matter if you're a foreigner, an immigrant or not. They're private, so it, that was the King's College, and um, uh, there was times that I wanted to throw the towel, um, but the Lord will help me, encourage me through people, and. Um, there was times I wouldn't eat dinner because I didn't have more money. I just had the money to take the subway from Long Island to get to Manhattan and back and come at 10 at night. That class was from 6 to 10 at night, but it was once a week. And it was an adult program. And then um, after that, I was supposed to continue studies, but I knew <laughs> um, I wasn't in peace 
at that point, I was like, where is my, my prince? <laughs> In all that time, I... But then you met Anthony. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, there was an opportunity to go to live to New York and, and, and be an intern for a nonprofit organization called New York City Relief. So I went there. I met Anthony, who was one of my coordinators. He was so wonderful because he trained me to help people who had problems with drug addiction and alcohol, and they were ready to go to, or we will encourage them also for years until they will come and say, I'm ready to go to a faith-based program. And, um, and it was wonderful. And we had a wonderful wedding. It was unbelievable. A lot of people from his church and some people from my church traveled from Long Island to New Jersey. Um, Cranford where it was my former church before coming to Tennessee. And we had a wonderful wedding. And he continued. Uh, and he, once we got married, he started to petition me. So we started a process with papers. And after five years, in 2010, I became a citizen. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. I, I couldn't find a picture of that day, but um, then the babies came, and I stayed at home. So I wasn't working in that ministry um, until Anthony felt after 13 years that God um, said, you can choose another place. I, I release you from this ministry. It's okay. I will bless you wherever you, you want to go. So we came to Tennessee. I had a dream where we were coming to Gallenberg. And at the same time, I share it because then everybody can help me to pray for it. Because in the, at the same time, I saw people really tall, really skinny. And I saw men and children completely covered in, in mud. In mud. And we know we have had a lot of floods everywhere in the world. But I think the Lord just showed me that this was going to happen to along the way. I don't know if it's specifically in our area, but that's what I saw after I saw that we were coming through Gallenberg. I didn't know Gallenberg. I didn't know. We didn't know this area. So we came like 40 minutes from New Jersey. But the Lord, we, we came with the Lord we, with his hope. And he's been our provider. And he's been opening doors for us, and um, and I pray I praise him. Um, it's a joy to serve with you, um, with you all. And um, uh, the Lord says in His Word in Psalm 32 um, that you, the the psalmist says, "You are my hiding place." Uh, and that's how I've been feeling forever. I've been feeling more than being a foreigner. It's a foreigner here on earth, right? But um, God is wonderful. I, I praise him, and I'll continue. I would like to continue serving him with all of you. Amen. Amen.